All right, I think we are live. Welcome to what I think will be, well, sorry. I, I won't say live like this is streaming, but this is, it's a live recording. Sorry, Ryan. Uh, welcome to what I think will be an episode numbered in the low 30s of The Car Diary by Javi S. Thompson. The reason I don't know for sure the episode number is because I'm trying this thing where I record a little bit ahead of time so that I can fit in guests with the chapter episode I'm doing. And right now, my chapter episode that I plan to do is for grading. So I would love to have this series of guest episodes regarding grading. And when I thought about this subject matter, I was wondering how to get an industry expert on this podcast because it's still relatively new. So how fortuitous would it be that I meet today's guest at the Industry Insider exclusive dinner party hosted by Beckett. I snuck into that one because I'm not an Industry Insider. Um, and actually, uh, I think I might have just admitted to a crime. So I might have to check the statute of limitations in Illinois for this. Um, but there were some big time hobby folks in the mist. And I actually mistook my guest for one of them. Um, Ryan, I don't know if we should say which one. <laughs> You can you can say it. It was pretty great, actually. I, forgot I can that say it. Happened, but yeah, that was. That oh was yeah. Well, that that was. It was almost like you were at the bar, and like that was my opening line to you or something. But uh, um, I mistook him for um, uh, a un unknown or faceless uh individual. I I mistook him for car porn. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it was me or someone else was like, hey, that's Carpon over there. I was like, why? Really? What? What's going on? So, um, but this led to a hilarious start to a wonderful conversation with you at the bar. Um, so not a lot of people, uh, I think not a lot of people are going to know you by face or even by name. But if you are on Instagram and grading is important to you, you have to know his Instagram account, Gemrate. Because every month, he puts out publicly available information in a very easily digestible chart that folks like me love and look forward to. He grew up in Cleveland, now, le now lives in New York, worked in finance, advertising, data, analytics before getting into the hobby full time to use all those skills uh, from, from the you know, non-hobby world. And I think you're going to know and love this fella. Ryan Stazinski from Gemrate and Gemrate.com. Welcome to the pod. Nailed it. Thank you for having me on. It was great meeting you in Chicago. Excited to continue on with this relationship. Awesome. So I'm so glad that I, I, I went up to you because, you know, I didn't realize three things. One, that you are the person behind Gemrate. Two, that you listen <laughs> to my podcast. Thank you so much. That's awesome. And three, that you're absolutely hilarious, which I would not have guessed from your content because it's about, you know, creating company pop reports. Um, so, you know, I we had just a great conversation. And um, now that I'm hunting, I'm like wondering, is it because we were having adult beverages? <laughs> but so we're, we're going to find out now, you know. Oh, God. But, yeah, well, um, I appreciate that. I mean, that's funny. I, um, I tend to be pretty dry on all the stuff I do, too, because I'm such a data junkie and I want to sort of like mm -hmm. keep that, you know. Uh, persona to some degree but I kind of think of what you're doing here is like the hot ones of the hobby I don't know if you watch the Sean Evans stuff with the wings and you know you get a lot of uh, vulnerability in your podcast I like that oh. so anyways, I, was excited. I like listening to it uh, very excited to be a guest on it you don't Thank you so don't watch much. hot ones oh, no no I, I I just don't have uh, the interviews in person where I could like you know have the person sweat in front of me I have definitely yes. watched hot ones I love it um there is definitely a way to get someone vulnerable by making them completely lose their senses because of insane, uh, uh, I forget what the units are, Scoville units of, uh, you know, habanero <laughs> ghost peppers. Uh, and then, you know, yes, but thank you so much. That's a really nice compliment. I Now it makes me want to go watch some of them. But um, <laughs> so this introduction, I... I <laughs> We're going to see how long this goes. We're going to see if this is going to go uh, long enough for two-parter or not. But um, before we get to Gemrate, I really wanted to kind of get your, you know, your, um, you know, I did a little bit of a brief introduction, which thank you so much for giving me a bio. You're like the first person to actually, maybe not the first, but um, just thank you for giving me a bio. Nothing against my past guests, but you actually understood the assignment. So I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, of course. But now, you know, I, I mentioned how you worked in finance and advertising and data analytics. All of this, I'm sure, just di dive t do dovetail. It, it goes really neatly into what you're doing right now. So is there anything that you want to kind of like share origin story, not just like with work going into your current work, but like, you know, your your time 
you know, like as a hobbyist and collector? Uh, no, I mean, look, I'm, I'm somebody that sort of, you know, I say you that bio and it really is sort of just like a non or unconventional path to sort of like where I'm at today, but I, I like learning, you know, I've heard you say the same, you know, like, I, I like to sort of like being a sponge and sort of taking on as much as I can. Um, I've gotten exposure to a lot of different industries, a lot of different ways of just thinking about, you know, understanding data, understanding uh, people. And so, you know, I learned a lot about data through finance. I learned a lot about people through advertising. And then I learned a lot about just like moving fast, making mistakes, sort of building a company through startups. And so, you know, I, I really wanted to sort of take my own shot. And that's sort of how I sort of stumbled into Gemrate a few years ago. Um, but a lot of it has come from just really like bringing hard to come by data to the market, whether that was in finance or whether that was in advertising or whether that was in the startup world. It's all sort of been like taking data that is not easily found and trying to wrap it in a way that makes sense. And so that's kind of what, that's the origin of like, well, that's a lot of my background and that's sort of the origin of Gemrate in a lot of ways. Okay. Um, how about you as a collector, just, you know, with the cards and the cardboard itself, like who do you PC? Like, are you like a Browns Cavaliers fan from, cause you grew up there or are you like a, you know, Knicks Giants Jets fan? Cause you're in New York. Yeah. I'm uh, I was a horrible collector early on. Uh, and then, you know, I took my, long hiatus from the hobby. I just, I like making transactions, you know, I'm somebody that likes to sort of like see things move, you know, it's, it's sort of like how I live in a lot of ways. Uh, and I am definitely like a bit of a chaos junkie. So I definitely like don't sit and hold a lot of things or at least historically mm -hmm. haven't sat and hold, held stuff for a long period of time. I'm definitely more, you know, I'm a, a Clevelander, you know, a diehard Clevelander. And so I definitely PC a lot of Cleveland players now. Mm -hmm. Um, and I like like a lot of like tier two stuff. So I try to sort of like, you know, be the first consumer of what I'm building. And so mm -hmm. I use Gemrate to sort of like surface like things that I just think like could have potential in the long term to be like more appreciated. Um, things that might be just like underappreciated today and that the price sort of reflects that I'm hesitant to say undervalued because that sort of gets, you know, whatever frowned upon. But I just like things that sort of like people are overlooking. And so my pockets of the hobby definitely like speak to that. Um, and then I love Bowman, which is like one of the things which is kind of, um, I didn't even know existed as a market when I first started getting back into cards in 2020. And I, I like that just because there's like a lot of information asymmetry there. You know, you can learn a lot about a prospect just watching their Instagram stories. And so, you know, there's, and it, there's not a lot of people doing that. So anyways, I, I I'm in and out of a lot of basketball stuff, a lot of tier two Panini stuff. And then I do a lot of Bowman collecting. Mm -hmm. And within that, I collect like a lot, I'm big on basketball. So I collect a lot of like Evan Mobley right now, for example. And, uh, I'm sorry to hear all that. Um, no, I was going to say uh, about the Cleveland Browns aspect. Uh, you know, I've, I've gone through your archives. I want to, you know, I do this for almost every guest. I go through their Instagram all the way to the beginning. And I've noticed that you've done specific before the pop reports for the grading companies. I feel like your content has evolved and changed. We're in the beginning. I think you did do some specific iconic cards um, and sets and like, uh, you know, th they were in baseball, hockey, basketball, Pokemon. That's what I could see from like, at least the, the, the image of the post in your feed. And so in my head, my joke was like, man, this guy does not like football and it must be because he's a Cle <laughs> Cleveland Browns fan. <laughs> I mean, look, there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, if you're from Cleveland, you, you're number one with the Browns and that's like, mm -hmm. how you, you know, so, sort of how you ride. And, uh, I just grew up in the era where the, the Indians at the time were sort of in the 90s were like hitting their stride. And I was always just a big Cavs fan. And the gotcha. Browns were such a was such a mess. And so, you know, and they've been such a mess for such a long time. That franchise drives me nuts. Uh, yeah. And, you know, they just have they're like very representative of a lot of what is, you know, something that's hard to overcome in Cleveland sometimes, which is like people are just always waiting mm -hmm. for the other shoe to drop. And yeah. the Browns like perfectly represent that. And so anyways, I'm, I'm sort of like cautiously optimistic about the Browns, but one, I'm not like as big into the NFL collecting just because it's so concentrated around quarterbacks. And two, yeah. I, I am like much less passionate about the Browns relative to how much I love the Guardians and the Cavs. Gotcha. Yeah, no, I mean, I feel like the uh, you, you definitely had a great season or two with the Cavaliers with LeBron coming back and, you know, even before he left. But that must have been a wonderful championship year to, to be a huge Cavs fan. And then the Browns, yeah, I mean – they're almost like it's it's almost like the perfect name with <laughs> i'm not gonna make a, a terrible joke but um not actually maybe this is a terrible joke um the brown <laughs> bags right i mean it, that's the, that's the franchise where they put the fans when they're embarrassed or they're not doing well they put the brown bags on their the brown paper bags on their on their heads is that right i don't even know i'm sure there was a point in time when that was okay you know, well they, they might we have, did. 
They might have to switch from paper to plastic. <laughs> I know. I <laughs> Sorry, know. that was see, that was the bad joke. I shouldn't have said it. Okay, kids, if you're listening, please don't put plastic bags over your heads. Although, I mean, really, just what are your parents doing? Um, okay, so I would like to start with a very basic thing because my I think the episode title for this is going to be like grading company pop reports and. We're going to dive in deep and get a little bit more archaic or more more intermediate to advance. But I want to start with the basic of what a pop pop report is. So I'm sure you have a definition. I asked ChatGPT what the question, uh, what, what it is. <laughs> so I'm just going to read it out loud. And then you just let me know if you want to add on to it. Is that OK? Yeah, perfect. All right. Uh, a pop report is a published census showing the total number of cards graded by a third party grading company. For any given card in any given grade, e.g. Mint 10, there will be a published pop report. Uh, and they don't even say that it stands for population report, but okay. A uh, pop report showing how many times the grading service has awarded that exact grade to that exact card. Yep. Yeah, that's a spot on. Yeah, it is interesting to even hear them say census because in the comic book world, they actually just refer to it as a census Uh so I think pop reports a little bit more specific to like the trading card world. Well, I mean, Skynet, uh, that was like a real thing, right? And I, I just feel like, you know, you're replaceable, I'm replaceable. They're, they're gonna, they're, I can't wait for the next uh, podcast where it's just ChatGPT talking in the voice of Alexa. <laughs> Siri. That's Look, great. I love I love ChatGPT. I know a lot of people uh, are skeptical of it, but, it, you know, as somebody who's working with code a lot, it saves me a lot of time. Yeah, no, it's awesome. Um, so you were on the Sports Cards Nonsense podcast with uh, Jesse Gibson and Mike Chiasefi two months ago. It was the episode June 5th. And I, I forgot that I had listened to it a while ago, but I re-listened to it just to make sure that I wasn't like duplicating questions and doing too much. So I almost feel like this might be the supplemental episode to that. So if there's any listener who who hasn't checked their podcast out, I'm actually wearing their T-shirt that I got from National. Perfect timing. <laughs> um, you know, I heard they shouted me out on the podcast and and – uh, all I got to say is everything Mike said was wholly inaccurate. Um, so that's all I'll say about that. Uh, but is that, is that your uh, setup to do your geo impression? Cause it's, it's a solid one. I'm ready for it. I'm always ready for it. No, I, you know, I can't do that, Jesse. No, with your sausage <laughs> fingers. I feel like my Simmons was a lot better, but you know, I just got to get like, get into character and like, the int- I don't know. Sorry, but thank you. Thank you, Ryan, for asking about that. Um, and again, thank you for listening. Every download counts. <laughs> so here's the thing. Uh, I want to talk about Gemrate. And, and again, the reason I want to say Gemrate.com is I didn't, you know, Gemrate is the is the Instagram account and there's so much information, but Gemrate.com is where you have a lot of the, you know, the actual raw information and a lot of like things that it's just more, much more information, but in Instagram, you know, everything has to be easily digestible and you do a really good job with that. So one of the things I love most about Gemrate is that it costs my favorite amount of anything in the world, free 99. Mm-hmm. So how does Gemrate work? Um, you can take this as different ways, right? Like how how does it work from uh, a uh, business standpoint? Like I know we've talked about that a little bit, but I want you to explain to the to the listeners. But, you know, how does it work? And you can take that in, in any way you want. Yeah. So um, when I got back in the hobby, You know, I was definitely somebody I bought into a lot of breaks. I was like overwhelmed with just like all the information, sort of all the mistakes that I was making and sort of just like, it's really hard to navigate pop reports in particular. And so uh, and I I also at the time, I don't really mention this much, but I was also somebody that was invested in options of collector's universe at the time, because I was somebody that was pretty active in the stock market. And so I was just doing a lot to sort of understand like what was happening, how to make how can I make better sense of these pop reports and just sort of understanding the tech a little bit better. Prior to that, I was actually building a company related to finance. um, And I was doing stuff in the DFS world where I was like, uh, that's daily fantasy sports, DraftKings, stuff like that, where I was pulling in projections from a bunch of different sources, like last minute for basketball. And so I was sort of learning how to just like pull in information from websites programmatically. Um, You could call it scraping if you'd like. I just like to say pulling in information programmatically. Um, Scraping is, is can be a, a dirty word to a lot of people. But anyways, I pull in information from the different sites. Um, and the idea is just to make it uh, a little bit more useful, package it in a way that maybe, you know, is consistent across the different companies. So the way that PSA talks about their population report is different than how Beckett talks about their population report, uh, different than SGC, different than CGC. And so I just wanted to tell a little bit broader of a story. Uh, and to do that, I started pulling in the information. I really was focused on PSA to start. 
And it was just to help me sort of think about like how many cards exist, you know, to your definition of the pop report, just like what's the sort of frame of reference or what does the landscape look like for certain sets, for certain cards, for certain players. Uh, and so I just started figuring out how I could do that with PSA's data first and went really deep into that and started to see that there's a bigger macro story that I could tell. And that's how sort of the Instagram stories and Instagram posts started to emerge. Uh, but I was really just building it for myself to understand like of all these cards that I have now, I had a ton of cards. Which ones of these are set up to grade? Could I actually make some money on these? Are these are there's is there sort of um, certain cards in here that could be good long term holds because they're just you know there's not a lot of them on the pop report um, you know and so just really trying to figure out like what to do with my collection was sort of the starting point. All all these other things were jumping off points, um, but it was really just sort of how do I, how do I get the most out of my collection to figure out what I actually had because I had a lot of stuff. I was really big in like the 2015 Guardians. I really like Francisco Lindor. And he was a rookie when Beckett was pretty high profile in the industry. And so if you just looked at like the PSA pop report at the time, you'd think that Lindor had like nothing graded, but it was all graded with Beckett at that time. And so I was like, well, this is kind of, this is kind of goofy. Like I'm like, if I'm trying to understand the Lindor market, I'm just looking at PSA, I'm only telling, you know, a third of the story. And so, and, and from a seller standpoint, people always want to tell you the, the sort of underreported part of the story, which is like through the lens of a single pop report, because it makes things right. look, look more rare. Right. And so, I was thinking about somebody who was making a lot of purchases and not necessarily fully informed. How could I help myself understand the market a little better? And in general, how could I make this market more accessible to people who just like either don't know it as well, or the data is just hard to come by. And so that's kind of like the, like the, like, I don't know. That was like the motivating factor was just like, how can I better, how can I make better decisions for myself, but it build a tool that could be more sort of, you know, um, utilized more broadly utilized across the hobby. That is so awesome. I, I mean, I really, I, I can't wait for this uh, episode to be published for people to know that this came from a place of here's a collector buying into breaks, spending money in the hobby, just a like an everyday man. But you have this uh, skill set. You know, I'm like like Liam Neeson and taking it. Like I have a particular set of skills, and I'm going to utilize them for the benefit of not just myself, but for for other people and you're sharing this information out. I think that's fantastic. So, I mean, I, I guess I don't even have to, I was, had a follow-up question is like, do you like to grade? You do, you do grade your cards. You like to grade. You like to submit to grading. Yeah, I grade, I grade a lot. I mean, that's one of the reasons I love going to the national. I didn't buy a single card, but I, I submitted cards with, you know, four different grading companies. Um, mm. And I like to test out the different grading companies. One of the people I listen to most in the space is Neo, uh, who you met also when we were at, uh, <laughs> The, the hobby event yes, uh, but yes. he, he's also sort of like you know he's big on the, the different companies play a different role uh and can sort of like service different needs in the hobby and so i like it i mean you could look at my instagram profile i graded with hga i've graded with a lot of companies in the space i'm not shy mm -hmm. about it i enjoy sort of understanding like the pros and cons uh, you know grading is one of these like hot buttons that people really feel um like they want to voice their opinion on but i, I think <laughs> yes. that there's you know and one of the reasons that gemray has been uh, received pretty well is that it's information that people can use to support. And it's hilarious. Mm -hmm. People will use the same data point uh, mm -hmm. and, and use it to defend Beckett and use it to defend PSA positively or, you know, right. SGC or whatever it is. And, you know, it's the same data point. They're just sort of like spinning it in a way that sort of fits their needs. And so I, I definitely grade a lot. Um, and, and I think it's a really fascinating space. Uh, but there's just been like a real lack of transparency, accountability, yeah. data in this, in this space. Yeah. Um, so Pat, I think the passion is such a double-edged sword. I mean, it's good that we have it because it shows that people care. But when it gets to be overly so, when people kind of lose their minds, I mean, I, I talked about the definition of what a fanatic is in an earlier episode. And, you know, it's like someone who's irrational. And <laughs> so we just have a ton of irrational people in this hobby space. I think that's fantastic. And what, <laughs> what can go wrong, right? With that. But yeah, shout out to Neo. Uh, he was uh, sitting next to you at the bar. I think he was like the one who's saying, yeah, yeah, no, that is card porn. Just get, continue. Keep talking to him as if he's card porn. <laughs> I was like, oh, fantastic. Oh, uh, you know, and then and then I found out he's the one who found out about the Atlantic City website. So shout out to Neo. Good, good guy in the hobby. Um, but can I ask you, uh, which four did you submit with? Because I know I submitted with Arena Club, which I've been making content about right now. And then soon I'll be making content about CDC. I'm not getting paid by these folks. It's more of like, like you. And the whole concept of this podcast is to try different things. I submitted with PSA and Beckett. And I wanted to try yeah. different ones. So um, could you tell me which four you did it with? 
Yeah, so I actually, I submitted with PSA. I did a bulk submission with them, 30 cards. I did a Beckett submission, um, which was 13 cards. I did a SGC submission, which was like, I want to say 14 cards. And I did an arena submission. And I also went to tag and tried to submit there, but I'm, I'm really big on Obsidian and they don't do 55 point cards right now. And they don't do die mm -hmm. cuts and uh, Obsidian is all those things. And so I couldn't actually grade with them and I didn't really have anything else that I was looking to grade specifically with them to test out the service. But I, uh, I tried, I used all four of those first time using arena. Uh, but it's funny because, you know, oh. it's like, you know, I have a reason for all of it, right? There's, it's not just like me just like throwing, splitting them down the middle and saying like, these mm -hmm. go to one, these go to another, you know, there's a, a I pre-grade everything, right? So I have a spreadsheet where I'll grade it myself yeah. and determine like, okay, this is what I think the four subgrades are and then I'll send it off. Uh, so it's like a, it's a bit of a process and there's definitely like an angle to it. So um, before I ask you the question, uh, the next question I had about, you know, wh why you only do the four major ones, you know, PSA, BGS, SGC, and CGC in your pop reports, not actually submitting, but um, I got to say, uh, I did two lives before national where I showed the cards that I was going to submit and then the spreadsheet or no, no, the ones that came back from grading. And it's almost like you show the cards and people just like, ooh, bright, shiny. Let me see those cards. They look really nice. So I have like, you know, like 10, a dozen people at any time in the live. And I'm like, yeah, you know, like they want to see cards. And then I ended the live and I was like, oh, I meant to, I forgot to do the whole spreadsheet, the part where I show the guess gate, <laughs> guessing of the grade and, you know, declared value and all that. And it's, it's almost like as soon as people saw the spreadsheet, they're like, nope, not going into this live. So like I didn't have more than like three people. It's like, oh, yeah, spreadsheets are boring if you're not. I mean, it's boring to almost anyone, but unless you're in data where you have to do them all the time. And I found it, you know, I would look at someone's, you know, what their grade guesses were. But maybe I just didn't do it in an optimized way for the live where, you know, I had like something in a, a whiteboard or something. But. Yeah, the the spreadsheets, people just their eyes just glaze over them. I guess. Yeah, I I uh, it's hard to incorporate into YouTube videos. PC Sports Cards does a really nice job of overlaying the data. Like they'll actually sort of like overlay pop reports and overlay mm. things that would be in a spreadsheet uh, or are in a spreadsheet, but like in a way that sort of contextualizes it. It's hard. It's I, I don't do any content specific to it because a lot of the data I see data sort of in the, through the lens of a spreadsheet and so mm -hmm. and tables and so it doesn't really translate to visualizations quite as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, spreadsheets are not for everybody, that's for sure, especially in this world. Yeah, no, for sure. And when it comes to, though, I mean, I'll give you credit, the, your Instagram posts where you do the four major grading companies and across the months and across the gem rates, like, I feel that you visually represent it in such an easy, easily digestible way. So I guess my question that I wanted to do was, do you only do those four major ones or is it only because with the amount of space you have in an Instagram, you know, square that you can only fit four into the chart? <laughs> it's a fantastic question. Uh, it's definitely uh, a bit of both of those. Um, you know, I think there's a few things actually. I mean, one is, you know, I just, I'm trying to stick to the most, you know, reputable graders to start. And that was sort of like, you know, a gem rate stands for trust, or at least I wanted to stand for trust. And, uh, you know, I want it to be high integrity data. And so, you know, I stick with grading companies right now that I know are going to sort of update their pop reports consistently. Uh, that have pop reports, right? Not all these emerging companies have pop reports, even like, you know, one of our sort of uh, founding principles was, or at least like sources of data was that we want, or ways to think about data was that we only wanted to sort of consume what the public saw. We wanted to be able to explain the data. If we can't explain the data, we don't really want the data. We don't want companies feeding us data. We don't get any of the stats directly from the company. That's one of the reasons we stick to the pop reports is we see the same data that everybody else sees. Um, and so the main thing is you have to have a, a working pop report that I, I feel is like reasonably laid out and uh, able to be sort of consumed um, by a human, but also programmatically. And then beyond that, you know, I have to see sort of secondary market volume because you could grade a lot of cards at a grading company, or you could add a lot of cards to the pop report that may never surface in the secondary market. And, you know, this hobby doesn't have like the cleanest past. And so I'm really cautious about adding companies until I actually see volume behind the slabs. And so, you know, even though these companies, I, I'm rooting for a lot of them. I think they make sense. I think their sort of stance and sort of like what they're, you know, what they're bringing to the hobby makes a lot of sense and is really interesting. But I'm, I'm sort of um, reluctant to add them to sort of like the prime time report, the monthly report that we do, because uh, they're just still, you know, early in the process. And, and it's not that I don't trust what they're doing. It's just they kind of have to be a little bit more established. You know, Gemrate sort of 
is aligning themselves in some ways, you know, with these companies and in, in saying that these are companies that we're sort of going to bat for, that they're going to be around for a while. We're not just throwing companies in and out of this report. You know, we want consistency to be a big part of how we report. And so we just don't want to add a company and then have to sort of, you know, we've had that issue right now, like CSG, for example, their pop report was down for half this year. And that's mm -hmm. kind of like not been ideal. I know why they're doing it and I'm okay with it, but it's like not ideal. And we can't have like five of those sort of instances on our reports or it just makes things hard to consume. And, and then the last thing is, yeah, the design side of it. It's just, I don't want to have 10 companies on there, uh, right, especially right. if only four of them are sort of driving the significant majority of the volume. And so <laughs> there's like a tier two report that I'm thinking about doing, which is just like, mm. I'm calling it tier two, but it's more of like an emergence emerging report, um, mm. which is just maybe a couple of slides. It's sort of like, you know, um, is a nod to the companies that are sort of newer and emerging in the space, but, and I'm very intrigued by that. And I think it makes yeah. sense, but it's also not something that I'm exactly sure I'm going to market with it yet. Gotcha. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask, I, so many things I want to ask here, but when you said, uh, you know, why CG CSG now CGC didn't put it up, is that publicly available or is that something that you just know and are not able to share? Right uh, now? No, I mean, it's, it's publicly available in that they were reworking their data. And as I sort of saw okay. what they were doing, you know, a lot of these pop reports are subject to look. I mean, everything is sort of for a reason in this world. And pop reports are really disorganized because the manufacturers don't give the grading companies a lot of data to work with. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of data entry. There's a lot of human error as that enters the process when cards are handed off to a grading company. And mm -hmm. all of them are subject to it. Uh, and so with CGC, CSG being newer, they had data entry errors that they were cleaning up. You know, they had duplicate cards on there. They're just trying to reduce errors. They were, you know, I didn't know behind the scenes that they were doing this merger, but I think as they were preparing to sort of merge the entities, they were like, let's clean up our data and make this sort of as smooth of a transition as possible. And so I could see that they were just reducing the duplicates. I could see that they were cleaning up, you know, the typos and the mislabeled parallels and things like that. And so, you know, that takes a long time to get it right. And so I could see that was happening. <sighs> Card manufacturers not helping the grading companies makes me immediately think about the potentiality of more vertical integration by fanatics. So let's not give them another reason to try to further uh, <laughs> cement the uh, what what do they call it like from the from the cradle to the grave of a card type of thing. Let's I, they, I'm sure they've already thought about all of this stuff. So um, moving on. Uh, so I wanted to ask. Um, or I wanted to reiterate something that you just said, um, you know, a few minutes ago, which was that you don't take any um, inside information. You don't get fed any information. Uh, there's no bias with data and information. What you what you provide is what the public can find out by themselves if they wanted to. It's just that people are lazy and people don't want to. But like you don't get anything fed. You don't have any insider information. You don't have like connections into the great company. I'm sure you talk to some of the higher level folks, but you're not skewing anything right i mean you're completely unbiased right yeah i mean look i'm as unbiased as i can be and objective as i can be um uh, yes to that point like everything we consume is what the public sees um nobody pays us to you know we've had mm -hmm. companies approach us to you know looking for inclusion in the pop report uh mm -hmm. you know we've had all the companies in some ways shape or form has sort of asked us about you know api integrations if we'd be interested and i'm just not interested in ways that i can't sort of have a little bit more insight into and sort of, you know, if somebody asks me questions and if I can't explain it, yeah. that's not productive for anybody. Um, so, so yes, that's definitely like a foundational uh, or fundamental to how we're thinking about the data. And, and no, again, it's no. all, it's all free. You know, one of the things that we're really thoughtful about is, you know, we're, we understand that we, we are pulling information from other sites that are making this data available and we don't mm. want to sort of like siphon traffic away and we don't want to mm. sort of like monetize, the thing that's exactly on their website, right? So we have to have some opinion or some sort of like way that we're adding value before we think about sort of how we're going to, you know, monetize what we're doing. And so, you know, I, I try to just remove friction. I'm trying to, I link out to all the grading company sites. Like my, my big sort of, you know, my, when I put on like my podcast politician hat is like the better data, the more confidence people will have in the industry, the more people that will enter the industry, right? And so like, that's the pitch I make is, is you think about like fanatics and collectors and all these companies that want the pie to grow, you need to have better data. And so this is like an entry point to just allowing people to sort of make better sense of it. Um, and yes, it's, but it's all, it's all what the public sees. And so I'm just wrapping it a little bit differently. Better ingredients, better pizza, Papa John's. Not an official sponsor. <laughs> I'm a Little Caesars guy. Little Caesars yeah, Little guy. Caesars. So I'm gonna fight that hard. 
Yeah, no, when you said better data, better transparency leads to better result, I, I'm like better, better, better. And then you said the word <laughs> pie and I'm like pizza pie. Easy, easy link in my head. The synapses yep. were just firing right off for that dad joke. Okay, so for me, I really do not like Papa John. So sorry, I'm sorry. Really it's, it. So yeah, you're gonna have to, yeah, you're gonna have to get a little creative with the Ro Roman Empire for your uh, branding then or something. <laughs> um, so okay, that's the last time I'll say that 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 pizza company uh, because you are you are <laughs> the guest of this pod. I want to make you feel comfortable. Um, Thank you. So I will say, uh, I will ask you, um, we were talking about, you know, how does Gemrate work? And then you did a really great job explaining about just everything surrounding it, but not definitely not asking for specific numbers, but how does it work from a business model then? Because you, you know, it's free for us. It's free for the grading companies. What, like you're not doing this for free, I imagine. Like how, how does that aspect of things work for you? Yeah. So real quick on the background, I mean, I was, you know, I had the luxury of sort of bootstrapping this for two years. I had a very, very small exit from a startup that I had worked at prior, which basically gave me two years to sort of a runway of not working full time and just trying to dive into something that I was passionate about and see if I could, you know, string it together and build a company. And so that was basically what I did, which is I, I just had a lot of belief that this data set could be used in a lot of different ways. Um, and if I could sort of compile it in a way that wasn't going to, you know, you know, uh, put me in the poor house, then I would approach it. And, you know, it's, it got dangerously close at times. Uh, but it's, you know, it's expensive to sort of do what I'm doing in the sense that, you know, I, I look at the pop reports every day and pull the data in every day. But that's really important to me in the sense that I want to be able to explain what's going on and if there's inconsistencies or things I need to be aware of. And that just requires daily recording of the data. Um, as it relates to sort of like the monetization side of it. So I actually, Gemrates was entered into a B2B accelerator. So what that means is, I'm with a cohort of companies that are, you know, it's a, the, the B2B accelerator is much more focused on like lifestyle. So I won't go into like the whole spiel about venture capital, but like, I think the sports card market was overcapitalized. Like I just think that too much money came in for how large the market was at the time. And people got caught up with crypto in a lot of different ways, NFT and a lot of different ways the market could expand. Um, and then, you know, obviously things corrected and they corrected pretty hard. Um, at the time I was just like focused on like, what could I build that sort of would, would sustain sort of a, you know, the ups and downs of the market. And I just felt like if I built a tool for collectors, which is what Gemrate is focused on, we would be able to sort of like withstand ups and downs. Uh, beyond that, though, I was really interested in like, okay, what could I do to sort of like scale the efforts? And so this B2B accelerator, which is really focused on like lifestyle companies, it's not necessarily focused on like venture capital. It's not necessarily focused on like home run exits, right? Like venture capital is geared towards like, um, you know, these outsized returns, $100 million plus, billion dollar plus outcomes. I just don't know that like the way that I sort of see Gemrate working in a, in a sort of like um, um, organic fashion, that that's like what I what I envision. And so I wanted to be able to have more discretion over the timeline. I wanted to be a little bit more uh, able to sort of like react to market trends and sort of feedback. And so this this accelerator called Tiny Seed I joined gave me some of that flexibility. It's not a ton of money, but it was enough to at least like pay myself a bit and cover some bills. And I joined that in November. Um, on top of that, we started to monetize and we actually sell the package data. So again, I don't want to do anything that the companies could directly do themselves, right? So like mm -hmm. PSA has APIs, SGC has APIs, Beckett will have APIs. If companies can give those APIs directly, I'm not really adding any value. I'm just sort of pulling in the data and doing the same thing that those companies would do individually. So a lot of our IP has been around merging the data and building this universal pop report, which has sort of like been my vision for a while, but it's not one that took a long time of collecting data and sort of like piecing together how I wanted to do that. Uh, but we, we started to make this universal pop report data available. It's not in a pop report in the sense of you go to a website, right? But if it's like, if you gave me a card and you wanted to see a 2019 Zion Williamson Prism Silver, and you wanted to see what that, the grading stats look like for all grades across all the companies, we could give you that. And that's not something any ind individual grading company could give you, right? So that was where a lot of our IP sort of stems from. And so that is what we make available to a lot of the collection tools. So like your car, any, any tool with the name card in it is using this to some degree. Well, not at everyone, but a lot of them. So like your card ladders of the world, um, card hedge, card base, they're using this data. Um, but we're also making it available to auction houses. You'll start to see it uh, a little bit more prominently on auction house websites. And they're using it to sort of contextualize cards, right? So, you know, with pricing data, you want to understand. It's kind of like the stock market, you know, obviously like that, that can be triggering for a lot of people, but it's like a stock market in the sense of like there's a price and their shares outstanding. And what we're delivering to people is a lot of these companies have the price. We're delivering sort of like the population or the shares outstanding part of this equation. So when you're entering the market and you're looking at contextualizing, is this card 
appropriately priced? Is there a potential for appreciation? We're sort of handing people the, the population or the shares outstanding part of that equation today. So that's how we're monetizing today. There's other ways, but that's sort of like the, the entry point for us at this stage. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you so much for that comprehensive explanation. Um, <laughs> Is that your nice way of saying really long and no, long-winded no, no, it's not. No? I, it just gives me a lot of um, conversational threads. I mean, the first thing I wanted to say was, I think I'm, am I a tool with the name card, Denny Cards? Am I a tool? So do, do I have to pay for this information? Uh, no, but um, no, this is really, I, I hope people gained a lot of information from that. So B2B for the people who are not aware, business to business and Accelerator, again, venture capitalists. I mean, again, like a bubble was created. We all know that. Um, and, you know, just the run up was was really large. I wasn't there for it, but just hearing from everyone as to how crazy and wild it was. Um, and, you know, venture capitalism is is definitely in and out of the hobby and, you know, when you're talking about outsized returns, I immediately think of like, you know, Zion and the ultra modern quarterbacks, like, you know, these, <laughs> everyone wants like the 10x and higher returns. And it's like, I don't, I mean, it's just, um, it wasn't sustainable, I think, but no, I'm glad. I mean, you know, I'm glad that you were able to bootstrap for two years. I mean, I'm sure you don't because you, you have to go through it, but tiny, you know, the word, the name is in there. It says tiny seed. It wasn't going to be like a huge seed. So but I'm glad it, uh, you got it off the ground. Yeah, um, thanks. So, okay, I'm done with all my jokes. Uh, no, there will be more later, but let's let's continue. Um, <laughs> we're about the 36 minute mark. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, when I listened to Jesse and Mike talk with you about the, um, I think it was the May pop reports, and you gave a mm -hmm. rundown. You know, right now we're recording at the uh, at the start of August, and at in that podcast episode, you mentioned how. Well, you mentioned, you know, many things, but like, you know, PSA was dominant with 85% of the market share. Then there was a dip uh, in May. Um, TCG, like I want to get into that a little bit about how dominant TCG is in grading companies. Um, but you also mentioned that what that June may look good with maybe a pre-national spike. Um, so I just kind of want to see a, a two month check in with that information. Let, you know, maybe get a little, a little bit more granular if, if you're okay with that. Cause I didn't really prep you to say that I was going to ask you about that. No, no, no. Yeah. I mean, look, I publish these reports every month and I, I do quickly like lose that information because I'm shifting context so fast, but with yeah. speaks to, or speaking to that podcast in particular, like I would say I was wrong in sort of my prediction there in the sense that I thought that the PSA sports card special would have started to hit the pop report sooner. I thought it was going to be productive for them. They did basically ran a nineties plus sports card special for 15 bucks, right. Or whatever it was, it was something really affordable. Um, and that's a lot of cards. That's the significant majority of cards that have been sort of <laughs> produced uh, and sort of matter to a lot of collectors outside of, you know, obviously the vintage market. And so um, I guess it's by definition, but anyway, the, uh, the special has seems to be well received, but it's definitely not hitting the pop report to the degree that I thought it would. And so like, you know, I think July was at 4% for PSA, um, 4% versus June and 4% year over year, which is like not massive. Uh, you know, they're still, they're still down off their highs. They were doing 1.2 million a month earlier this year. And they they did, uh, just over a million. I think they did a million 40,000 in July around that. And so, you know, they're, they're still, they've got a really high floor at this stage, but they're not like, necessarily they're being um carried by tcg still to what you to your the point you're making earlier like they just opened up psa japan and if you dig into the july numbers a lot of their strength in july was through opening up that office they basically opened up that office and started doing ten thousand more tcg cards a day in mid-july and so you know without that i make that point to only say if you strip that out it actually would have been essentially a down month you know had that happened though PSA might have put a little bit more urgency around like grading these sports cards and getting having them at the pop report. I don't want to be so um, naive to think that like people are <laughs> or um, you know working day in day out to sort of like hit have numbers hit the pop report that Gemrate's going to report on. Like people aren't obviously like doing things internally to sort of or at least like not at a grand scale to sort of like make sure that their Gemrate numbers are good every month. I'm sure there's some like things in the margins people do. But anyways, point being is like, you know, there's some engineering that's happening here, population engineering, like PSA knows sort of like, okay, we're gonna have Japan strong now. So we don't necessarily need to have like the sports card special hit. And I'm not exactly saying that's what's happening, but like mm. if I'm looking in behind the scenes, like 
they're probably comfortable knowing that like, look, we're going to have this sports card special hit and that's going to hit in August. Right. And so they did like mm. not, they didn't have like necessarily the strongest promotion uh, offered to collectors in August, which was like a sixties focused sports card special, right. And a reholder special. So my point with that is just like, I feel like they kind of know that they have a backlog that's going to hit the pop report. So they can kind of like pull these levers to be like, show this trajectory. And again, it's not really Gemery focus. It's more like internally, how do we sort of continue to show progress? And so I think a lot of that's happening. And I was, I, <laughs> this was a long winded answer of saying I was not right in the sense of like, I thought sports cards were going to be a little bit more of the story in July. And I think it's going to be a bit more of the story in August instead. But PSA mm. Japan opening and TCG sort of hitting TCG was 50% of the cards graded in July for PSA. Wow. Like that's massive. That's, yeah. that is a massive number that I don't think anybody could have imagined even a year ago, they were doing 200,000 TCG cards a month. Now they're doing over 500,000. Right. So Ooh. it's a massive number. Uh, and it's 50% of cards being graded right now. And I think it's still sort of potentially going to take share of the overall market. So it still may, may even be early there. I mean, I'm just doing the math quick in my head. It was 200,000 cards a month, TCG, and now 500,000 cards per month. That's 300,000. There's 30 days in, on average on a month. So that's, that is 10,000 more per day, which sounds absolutely insane. But again, I mean... <laughs> I don't even know. I have no like, uh, you know, my kids collect Pokemon and 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 they're and they're just kind of I'm not into Pokemon as much, uh, but that is just so impressive. Um, so let's say you strip away all the Pokemon. Is PSA's market share just lower uh, from, from a from a sports card standpoint? Um, I don't know if it's lower from a share standpoint, but it's lower from a volume standpoint. Like what I mean by that is I think basketball has sort of been the biggest headwind basketball for PSA, for example, was doing like 200 to 250,000 a month a year ago. It's only doing like 90 to a hundred thousand right now. So it's down by 60% of where it was, right. Or it's off 60% from where it was at its highs. Um, that is a big headwind. And I don't think that's a PSA specific headwind, although PSA definitely benefited from all the momentum in basketball during the peak of, you know, the pandemic. And so that's, that's a, a major headwind, uh, but I don't think it's PSA specific, but it is definitely like they, like this hobby kind of needs one Yama to, to be productive <laughs> uh, because it does, it trickles down into a lot of other rookies and vets. And you could see, you mm -hmm. saw what happened. I mean, it's not, you know, that it was an avalanche, but I do think like the snowball started with like Zion and J Zion, Zion and job being collectible. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of these other marginal players, were hit in packs and breaks and all these different things that people right. just started grading to sort of like bail themselves out. Right. I think that, you know, if you have a Wembenyama that is sort of driving that market, you could see like a, 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 some, a productive basketball market, but it's been, it really has sort of like limited the upside. So that's the reason where like to your question at the start, like they would be down, like sports are down year over year. And so, and it's mostly driven by basketball. Wow. You actually see baseball is okay and football is okay, but basketball is just getting crushed from, from the highs. Wow. Um, I'm putting a pin on my notes. Minute 42. This hobby needs Wen Banyama. I am going to figure out if I, whether I'm going to make that into a, a clippable <laughs> uh, thing for my promos for the for the podcast. But no, that's oh, my goodness. You you are so knowledgeable. Um, thank you for all this information. Um, and yeah, please go as long as you want, because I, I'm just I'm just learning. I'm you know, what's great about this is like I don't really edit my my podcast episodes with the stream yard, but it's almost like I am like the the uh, premier audience of my own content where I get to learn all this. And then a few days later, I'll publish it. I mean, it depends on when because I have to do my own chapter episode about grading. But I can't wait for people to hear what you're saying. And I, I think I have to do it really soon because like you said, like it's almost like I don't know if you would agree, agree with this, but, but like every day, every week, definitely every month, uh, the, the grading landscape is shifting. Yeah, I mean, well, one, I appreciate the feedback um, and to you know like you're saying like i you know being sort of the biggest consumer of what you're building is is fun and so i think that keeps it really authentic and organic and sets mm -hmm. this up for success so um i definitely could appreciate that and yeah i mean like the grading landscape is like it gets a lot of attention and it is pretty dynamic in the sense of just like there's a lot of news a lot of noise and a lot of opinions and so you know you know these things i'm saying could definitely change i do think these broader trends of like tcg is here to stay i think basketball needs a resurgence to sort of like bring some more upside into the grading uh, yeah. industry. But yes, I would definitely, definitely things that we're starting to see emerge or trends that I'm watching at least.
absolutely terrific. Thank you. Um, now I'm going to figure out what I think that we might have to make this a two parter because I haven't even gotten to the questions from Instagram uh, from folks where I made a post like, hey, I'm going to I didn't say it was going to be you, but I said, you know, I'm going to have a discussion with someone about our report <laughs> and I have some really good questions for you. However, the first one I have to ask you, and this might be the start of part two. Can we talk about declared value? Because that is the hardest thing for any submission that I have um, where PSA or, you know, anyone, but they're like, hey, take a guess as to what your card's going to cost.